celebrating his efforts to show that he understands the concerns of Muslims who feel that they've been maligned and that he wants to heal scars from the past. And yet, despite his PR moves, we've seen protesters burning U.S. flags, effigies of the president, and they've also been shouting, listen, Obama, we're all Osamas. What's your view on this? Well, that really is the, if you will, the harvest of the Obama policy, the Obama diplomacy. President Obama really believed in his own biography, and some of the things that he said about his ability to heal the rift between America and the Islamic world, some of these things border on narcissism. He believes that the world, that the world of diplomacy began with an ascension to the presidency in 2009, and now we see it didn't, it is not so. And the idea of just going and offering apologies, it's not really the point now. The point is to look at the Islamic world unsentimentally, to look even at a place like Benghazi unsentimentally. You have killers in Benghazi, and then you have the poor people of Benghazi who've gone out to express gratitude toward the, the United States. But I think this is a reckoning time for President Obama. The Islamic world has served notice on him. Well, within these countries, we're learning more about extremist groups that are not limited to Al-Qaeda. We're hearing more about, for example, the Salafis. Who, who yeah. are they, and how concerned are you about their impact on what's happening right now? Well, we should be concerned, and these societies themselves, the, the Egyptians, the Tunisians, the Libyans should be concerned, and they are concerned. We saw redemption to some extent in Libya. People went out and attacked Ansar al-Sharia, as your lead piece said. So people look at the Salafis and they have to wonder whether they want to live under the control of the Salafis. You have the Salafis who won 25% of the vote in Egypt, and there is insanity among the, in, among the ranks of the Salafis. Uh, they want to cover the pyramids uh, in Egypt. They don't want tourism, etc., etc. So I think in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Libya, and beyond, the Salafis have to be disciplined by the, the population itself, as we have seen in, in Libya. We can't really do it from a distance. We can't do it by remote control. The Salafis right now, they're growing then in their influence in that country? I think it, it depends on what setting we're talking about. In fact, what's really troubling is the growth of the jihadist influence among the rest of the Syrian rebellion. And that's because we never went to the rescue of the Syrian rebellion. But in Tunisia, the ruling coalition in Tunisia, without getting into kind of inside baseball, the ruling coalition, which is Islamist, wants to draw a limit for the Salafis. In Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is in the saddle, which is empowered, really has no, nothing, no use. Uh, for the Salafis. And in Libya, we have seen that thing we've been looking for for so long, gratitude. People went out and expressed sorrow for the murder of, of Ambassador Stevens and gratitude toward the United States. So the battle is joined. Very disturbing. Well, so many people thought the Arab Spring was going to lead to brighter days in the Middle East, but it's clear that we are definitely in the midst of uncharted waters as we deal with the underlying Muslim rage against the West and with leaders who must play to two different audiences, the one on the world stage, for example, and the one in their own backyard. No, you're absolutely right. But I don't think we should become nostalgic for the age of the dictators. The other day, Ambassador, uh, Senator Marco Rubio from Florida gave a remarkable speech where he said that, in fact, if you take a look at the Islamic world, now there are people who are saying, ah, the Arab Spring has failed, we should yearn for the age of the dictators. But if you look back on what the dictators gave us, the dictators, the Arab dictators, gave us 9-11. They gave us the jihadists who came our way 11 years ago. So we have troubles now with the Arab Spring, but let's not grow nostalgic for what the, for the, what the Islamic world looked like uh, before the Arab Spring. Indeed, Fuad Ajami, always great to see you, and thank you so much for your insights. Thank you.